Welcome to the third in our series of the Theology of the Body Reflections. As we know, this is a series of reflections by St. John Paul II, known under this popular title of Theology of the Body, which is reflecting on love, the human person, and topics like marriage and vocation. In this lecture, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last series, which was looking at the Pope's very detailed and multi-layered reflection on the beginning, the beginning of creation, the beginning of humanity. Adam and Eve see each other and themselves with wonder, gratitude and reverence. Adam, as we've previously seen, is deeply attracted and ecstatically delighted when he sees the newly formed Eve, the Eve that has been given to him as a beloved other, but is nonetheless not just an attachment of him, she's truly her own person. She's a person made for her own sake by the Creator, as John Paul II says. Adam views and responds to his beloved's feminine body with something of the Creator's vision. He sees her as God sees her. This is a theme that John Paul uses again and again. The Pope reflects that in the naked Adam and Eve, there is no struggle between the physical and the spiritual, between the erotic and the moral, between intimacy and outward attraction. We know we don't quite experience it like that all the time. There is between Adam and Eve a reciprocal regard, whereby the man and the woman see each other through and in their bodies as a true communication to each other. They also share in God's vision. That vision which sees the manifestation of the human body as a blessing, as beautiful, as very good, as an expression of the person. Here John Paul II draws together his extended excursus into nakedness as a sign that Adam and Eve shared the original good of the divine vision. But in breaking the original covenant, humanity has inf is been infected by ingratitude and sin, and we're forever tempted to view the naked body as a thing, something which induces us to depersonalise another person, to depersonalise ourselves. And this depersonalisation takes place through lust or envy or brutality. We, we view things with what John Paul would call the hermeneutic, the interpretation of suspicion, distrust. The tawdriness of those exploitative billboards that we see, the consumerisation of the human body in pornography, the horrific shame of the naked bodies of our sweets, jars violently against this original dignity of the naked body. They are visual heresies and violations of human dignity. Nowadays, we are ambiguous about our naked bodies. Just as the book of Job reminds us, nakedness is a sign of our vulnerability. It's a sign of our indigence. It's a sign that we are going to die. This is how we come from mother, mother's womb and it's how we go to the tomb. We don't take our clothes with us. John Paul infers here that the tragic loss of the beautiful clarity and purity of original nakedness is not simply a moral problem or an intellectual problem. It's not only that we are lustful and violent and stupid, which we sometimes are, but because we, like our first parents, break the first commandment. We fail to accept ourselves as a gift from God. We fail and refuse to accept the fullness of love. We're suspicious of the gift. We don't trust it. This short text from Genesis 2 also provides a hinge into the story as it continues in Genesis 3, where the text states that when Adam and Eve sinned, their eyes were opened, that they can't be naked any longer they can't be man before woman and vice versa without experiencing shame. Adam and Eve now sense that they have to hide their nakedness from each other and even from God. 
John Paul II notes that shame is an interesting thing. It's not only an unfortunate side effect of the rupture of our covenant with God, which it is in part, but also it has some other complex elements. It's a complex experience. Shame reminds us not only of the rupture of the sign, but it's also a vestigial and often powerful reminder of the original meaning of our sexual bodies, our original value as concrete and unique persons, which we experience in original solitude. To be shameless, therefore, to be without any shame in history, is not a remedy for the rupture. Ra rather, it's a fruit of the rupture. Now, this is an interesting discussion that John Paul begins here. Shamelessness, as we know it, is actually, to be without shame, is a falsification of the meaning of the body and of our relationships with others. It's both a moral fault in our way of thinking, but to be shameless is also to have a false belief. It's intellectually incorrect to think that if I act nakedly without shame, I'll be able to remove shame that I'll be able to restore the original nakedness of the body. It doesn't work like that. For instance, nudists tried to overcome the universal sense of reserve we have in being naked before strangers by contriving to encourage a kind of jolly communal nudity. And the, you know, by surrounding themselves with naked bodies, they're going to remove shame. But what they create is a strange sense of exposure doesn't in any sense convey the original nakedness of Adam and Eve, their exclusive and spousal way of looking at each other. They actually are contriving to find original nakedness and they fail. John Paul II will later write about the use of the naked body in ways which do not induce a blind or lustful attitude. They do, are not blind. There are works of art, for instance, that are not blind to personal meaning. Some great works of art are studies of the naked man or woman, which are both meaningful, beautiful, and evocative of the importance of modesty. Modesty, or if you like, the true respect of the body's meaning, including the meaning of the original nakedness, can be a question of attitude, posture, intention. And we can see this in social ways too. A doctor examining a patient or a physiotherapist giving a massage to a player also rightfully respects a person's nakedness. This respect for modesty is not only a personal value, personal virtue, it is a mark of an ethical civilization. It is a true personalism, a true respect of the human person. So John Paul II shows us here that modesty, the right response to the original nakedness, is not part of a mystification of the truth of the body. It's not um, inspired by Puritanism, but in fact is a token of love and respect because we all have that element of shame which reminds us how we should be truly viewed in our original nakedness. Pope Benedict XVI writes in his encyclical Deus Caritus Est, number 31, that love is the opposite of blindness. It's not about being ashamed of the truth. It's not about hiding from the truth. Since we are now what John Paul will call historical men and women, that is, we live in an age affected by the broken covenant, true love aims to protect the immeasurable dignity, the enchanting beauty, and the vulnerability of human, the human body, especially in relation to its nakedness and its sexual identity. Ultimately, nakedness is venerated by insisting on an explicit promise of covenant and sacrament in marriage. In marriage, a man and a woman can once again recover some of the beauty of original nakedness before each other because they go back to a covenant and re-establish that covenant before they try to discover original nakedness. Can you see how that works? The modest use of vision and of experience in our own times and in our own lives 
takes us now on a different route back to the experience of original nakedness. But it shares this respect for the reciprocal meaning of the body, which reveals the gift-like nature of man and woman, and what John Paul calls the made-for communi communion language of the body, the language of the body, in its spousal dynamic and meaning. So going back to the, the great love, the desire for unity between man and woman, but now taking a different path through the sacrament of marriage. In this lecture, we will continue with the Pope's very detailed and multi-layered reflection on beginnings, the beginning of the creation, the beginning of the cosmos, the beginning of humanity. And particularly using that privileged window upon original experiences of man and woman, which is opened up for us in the second book of Genesis. In this reflection, the Pope takes us on a third path into repersonalizing and therefore re-evangelizing our thinking about the human body particularly as that body is distinguished by its sexual identity. We've looked at the original unity and now we're going to look at another experience. Here the Pope particularly wants to find to the key to the mystery of the human person, embodied and sexed, by clarifying our vision of the body as it appears and as it is experienced, both objectively if you like, from the outside, and subjectively, if you like, from within our experiences, from how we feel about our bodies. The Pope minds in this reflection just one single line from Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And he draws us into an exegesis uh, of the biblical anthropology contained just in that one line. And he builds on what he's already proposed about the original the original uh, solitude and the original unity. But he adds now his own personalist philosophical insights, his own background as a personalist philosopher, particularly which those ideas that can be found in his earlier masterpiece called Love and Responsibility, written while he was uh, still a priest and bishop. The Pope makes one further connection in this reflection, and that is by drawing this single biblical line into the anthropology, the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. Particularly, um, the section of the Second Vatican II Council's teaching in Gaudium et Spes, number 24 and 22. So he draws, this, he draws a three-way thread between these three parts of thought, biblical teaching and church teaching. This reflection by John Paul II reintegrates and realigns some expressions of Catholic catechesis in the recent past particularly, which tended to emphasise our ability to will, decide and think, or if you like, our intellectual, moral and spiritual powers as those things which are the key indicators of our being human and rational beings. Especially since the influence of the Enlightenment secular philosophies this emphasis on our mental, volitional uh, powers often overshadowed and diminished the immediacy of our body, the importance of our body, by emphasising always what's going on inside us, our spiritual powers to the detriment of our bodily capacity. And even in the church, this dualism, this opposition between the body and the soul became evident. And sometimes that had expressions in a puritanical or even a body-denying type of thinking or attitude. John Paul II now takes us through a series of several Wednesday audiences, and he wants to here focus on the human person and his or her life, and the power of the sign in the body, which he calls a witness to creation as a fundamental gift. He has this notion that the human body is a sign and is aware of its own sign, itself as a sign. So this is a really complex idea in which he tries to catch what he calls the spousal meaning of the body. Up to this point he will say, it's only within the horizon of this notion that we are a created gift, which we read within the crosshairs of those three original experiences we've described, that we can arrive at an adequate anthropology. Do you remember we used that? that notion of a complete and full notion of the human person. Each person, the Pope says, like our original parents, not only speaks through the mystery, the fragility 
and the beauty of his or her body, but also bears within himself and herself the inner dimension of the gift. Just want to take a little time out here to explain this. John Paul proposes what he calls a hermeneutic of the gift. The body is a gift, creation is a gift. A hermeneutic is a way of understanding or interpreting reality. And he counters what we in our own sinful way have as a hermeneutic of suspicion. We're suspicious that it's not a gift, that it's a thing, that it's going to be taken away, that it's threatening. The hermeneutic of the gift is that our bodies are part of the original gift from God. And if we view it this way, in the way that Adam and Eve originally did in their innocence, then we return to a real adequate anthropology, that we see ourselves as a gift, that we see our bodies as a gift, we see our sexuality as part of this packaged gift. Anything less than that is in some way denuding the original gift. So it's about our understanding and knowledge of ourselves and of creation as a gift. And it's quite radically different to a hermeneutic which says, God's out to get me, my body's an opposition to me, if I could only get out of the cage of my body, all these ways of thinking and interpreting the human body that are less than a full and complete anthropology. Incidentally, uh, Pope Benedict XVI will also play on this idea that we are deeply suspicious of God because we've lost the vision of the hermeneutic of the gift. He doesn't use those words, but he has that meaning. Pope John Paul will note that in order to understand the gift of our own original solitude and our own original nakedness and our own concern for others, we need to learn about our original experiences or relearn our original experiences with another person or within a wider community. Now, we know quite well that children learn to appreciate the mystery of their bodies that in the tender respect their parents give them. We know that children appreciate themselves when their parents treat the, their bodies with respect and reverence, not with violence or disgust. And it's also why any form of the misuse of a child's nakedness in the emerging awareness of a child is so terribly destructive. We know this in all the terrible stories we hear about child abuse. That's why it's so serious. Most of all, we come to be seen by the one who has given us as a helpmate. Masculinity and femininity, namely sex, is the original sign of creative donation, of self-giving. So we learn about ourselves from our beloved. We learn to recover the hermeneutic of the gift in our own experience. This is a return or an insight into original beatitude here understood in its fullest sense as an original grace, an original gift, charis gift, and as an original happiness and fullness. This blessedness of male and female human bodies is also linked to the blessing of fruitfulness, of procreation, of having children, of parenthood, which we see referred to in Genesis 1. We can slip into a shallow reductionism if we consider the naked man or the naked woman as simply a study of the naked ape. Neither sex nor procreation are simply the result of instinct or urge in the human person. But they do arise through the natural world into the gift of the body, into the freedom of the gift, into the freedom of our nakedness into the freedom of our original meaning. What I mean by that is because we, if we return and see our bodies in the hermeneutic of the gift, we no longer see it as a, as a kind of blind urge or even as an impossible need. This free gift of the spouses to each other in love and in fruitfulness now engages the recollection and self-mastery of a couple. Self-mastery. We gather together ourselves and what we have to give in a mature and sincerely integrated and loving gift of self. Self-mastery. We need maturity and self-mastery, the Pope will later say, to be able to give that gift. These capacities, our intellect and our will, are God-given capacities. They do enable us to transcend and interact with the immediate and the material aspects of our existence. 
And of course they are part of us being made in the image and likeness of God, what in Latin is called the imago Dei, part of, essential part of our teaching of the church, that the spiritual powers, our mental powers and our intellectual powers, our wills, are a very important part of that. And also because we image God, who is spirit, goodness and truth. So the capacity to know the truth is something we share with God. However, Pope John Paul II in his catechesis takes us on a journey of rediscovering our body again. If you like, it's a very earthy narrative using this Yahwist account, which allows us to go back to our origins in God and in the dust of the earth. Remember that term, Adama. We are still part of this God's creation and our bodies are signs of that. And part of the original experiences show us to be embodied. We are made of the stuff of the earth. As the philosopher Leon Cass in his own study of Genesis writes, although formed from the ground and man is not alienated from it, he appears at first to be right at home, that is, at home in his body, at home in the cosmos, at home in the garden. In the larger context, this reflection also belongs to Christ's authoritative words. Remember the words from, from Matthew, which we've examined previously. And he's revealing himself through his incarnation. Even Christ's death recapitulates the importance of the body, his body stripped and exposed. We are at the same time spiritual and embodied. We have inward meaning and outward expression. In the beginning, we were at home in our own skin. We were at home in creation. After a short explanatory notice, John Paul II, in his audience number 11, considers a third original experience, which flows from this original being in harmony and at home in our bodies, revealed in a very short piece of text, noting that man and his wife were naked but not ashamed, Genesis 2.25. John Paul insists that despite the shortness of this little piece of text, it is anything but a throwaway line, it's anything but an aside. Far from being a marginal comment, the text provides a really crucial insight into the original man and woman's consciousness and their moral and ontological perception. Now what I mean by this is their perception of reality and their moral sense. They're both united and integrated in the way they're often not for us. On one hand, Adam and his wife are revealed as having an innocence and by this we mean a purity, a purity of seeing. They see each other as sexed and differentiated bodies, but in a way that is transparent. What this means in the thought of even earlier Carol Voitier was thinking is that it's the vision, the pella lucid vision, which he writes about in Love and Responsibility. That is, we perceive and conceive of each other in a way that sees the whole reality. We see the personal and the objective. We see the quality of each other's bodies and their values. We see the beauty and the truth. This is seeing, not in a childish way, but seeing in a rich, mature and unselfish way, a disinterested way. At the same time, Adam and Eve experience themselves in all their physical details as really masculine and feminine. And they experience this in a way that is unthreatened and unthreatening and unafraid. Underneath this peaceful viewing of themselves, in and through their bodies, which does not co pose an obstacle or a tension with the workings of knowledge, but is one with it, is this kind of unifying of experience and knowledge. Prof Professor Livio Molina captures this idea of original harmony between the knowledge and body in man and woman at the beginning, when he observes this. The body is first of all, the place of openness to reality, or better still, 
the place which offers hospitality to reality, which touches the person and consults and provokes him. That's a great quote, isn't it? It's one which really captures this idea of our capacity for reality, our desire for reality, which is not at odds with our bodily experience. This, John Paul explains, is because Adam and Eve still see and hear and experience themselves within the original covenant with God and therefore within themselves and with each other. John Paul writes, hearing the word in all its truth and, of ex and accepting love according to the fullness of the demands of creation. They see each other and themselves with wonder gratitude and reverence. The Pope sees his reflections here linked to the important restored anthropology, the theology of the human person, which we see in the Second Vatican Council teaching document called Gaudium et Spes, Joy and Hope, number 24, which links three important threads about the human person together. That spousal love, the love between a husband and wife, is in a special way like the love of God. It is imago Dei, it's made in the image and likeness of God. Secondly, that God created human beings so that he could love them for their own sake, as persons, not as things, not as something less than a person. And thirdly, that we can only find ourselves in giving a sincere gift of ourselves. A sincere gift that is free, total, loving and mutual. And here's an echo to Paul VI's document, Humane Vitae. John Paul writes here, the human body, orientated from within by the sincere gift of the person, reveals not only its masculinity and its fem femininity at a physical level, but also reveals such a value, such a beauty, that it goes beyond the simply physical level of sexuality. So he's tying all these ideas together in that line. At first, Adam and Eve were able to see themselves and each other in the light of this spousal meaning, in, this, in the light of this hermeneutic of the gift. Even the blurring and distorting effects of their later sin, their rupture with God, their alienation and disability and failure, cannot eradicate this true image of God, which is formed so dynamically in the divine artwork, which is us, that it can't be extirpated. In marriage, a couple promised to return to their new original nakedness, their restored original nakedness, through the grace of Christ in the sacrament, so that they can once again view each other's bodies with purity of heart. This is, however, something that even married couples will continue to struggle to do. Now we need not only to have the hermeneutic and the ethos, the sensibility of the gift, we know we need the ethos of redemption. More on this as we go along. We can say that our bodies are like fragile and luminous wedding gifts from God the Father. They bear in them an inner meaning which we are invited to offer as a gift on our way to the final wedding banquet with God. The blessed trinity of the persons, which is the wedding banquet, the life in God. Our bodies, therefore, and our sexuality are shaped like wedding gifts. They are sealed with spousal meaning. Sexuality can only be aptly experienced, given and received when they're given in a spousal way freely, reciprocally, generously, faithfully, and totally. Professor Jose Granados captures the Pope's thinking beautifully when he says, we are children, we children of the one God, are made to be spouses. And that's an interesting thought because most, some of us will not marry, but our love and our vocation is to be, is to be shaped spousally, whether we're a nun, a priest, or a husband and wife, or a single person. Somehow our love is to be given spousally. John Paul too proposes that in the beginning was the gift. In fact, we might summarise 
all of his theology of the body, all of that great work of the theology of the mind, body and heart and of the human person with one dramatic gesture, the giving and the receiving of a gift. Thank you. We'll now look forward to our next session shortly.